Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As I have been traveling across the diocese over these last 13 weeks, I have been preaching a series on the Nicene Creed. And today, in this 13th Sunday of this series, Uh, We come to these words. On the third day, Jesus rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. On the third day, Jesus rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. This is, as well as the rest of the creed, one of the most ancient confessional statements uh, that the church uh, makes Sunday after Sunday. In a moment of sobriety. Uh, While watching an old TV show, only some of you will remember, Starsky and Hutch, (laughs) Iggy Pop, who many of you won't know, and David Bowie got together every Friday night to watch on the Armed Forces Network, Starsky and Hutch. And they were both struggling with addiction at the time, and they were both sober. And so they wrote a song entitled, A Lust for Life. Now, you'll, it, there's about a minute and a half in the song that's just music without any lyrics at all. And if you were to go play this song, you would recognize it today because it's not only used in movies, but it was also used for Caribbean cruise lines. (laughs) It was about addiction, uh, and uh, it depicts a lust for life, which is equated today with entertainment, fun, vacation, goods, and services, to which many of us are unaware that this too is one of life's addictions. So we come to a desire over time of a more perfect life, a lust for life, but one that seems to meander, hoping that something else will fulfill our most deepest hope. And along with this lust for life comes its companion along the way death. And the first followers of Jesus, they hoped for life too. (laughs) But they had a realization that the life they hoped for was not able to be received in this world, but lay awaiting them. And I would suggest that we might want to hearken to their words. As together we hold a few of these words, on the third day he rose again from the dead. We say it every Sunday. (laughs) We don't often take time to consider what it means, but the first followers hoped for and desired a life to come, rested in the knowledge that no matter what came for them in this life, whether it was good or hard, did not matter as much as the promise and hope of the life to come. And that by holding that life to come, in their hearts, they actually could live through anything in this world. On the third day, he rose words of faith. He rose in accordance, we say, with the scriptures. When the Nicene Creed was drafted over a period of years and a lot of real fighting, the faithful community of the church argued 
But it argued out of a sense not just of the scriptures that we know today as the New Testament, but primarily out of the witness of the Old Testament. The testimony of the first witnesses who experienced Jesus' resurrection, they had no New Testament. All they had was the prophetic words of the Old Testament. And so if we focus closely on what that really means, we begin to understand that the scriptures that we're speaking of when we say in accordance with are not simply the New Testament of which we preach very often, but also are found deeply in the words of Psalm 16, for instance. 1610, for you will not be abandoned my soul, you will not abandon my soul to the depths of Sheol, to darkness. You will not abandon it. This is recited, by the way, when Peter in Acts comes to terms with what it means for salvation. And Peter cites it in that great Pentecost sermon in the book of Acts, where thousands of people on that day began to believe. In Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 10, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This sense that God will provide for us. Luke 24 is where that one is repeated. God rose on the third day in accordance with the scriptures with a promise of hope for each one of us. Hosea 6, 2, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Christians saw that this was thematic and parallel with who Jesus was. You could take Jonah, just the first, you don't even have to read the whole book. You just start at the first verse. First chapter, 17th verse. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for how many days do you think? Three days. Three days. And so they understood Matthew 12, 40. Jesus refers to Jonah's Jonah's experience as a sign of those things that would come for him and for us. Daniel 12, 2, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, John 5, 28. Jesus talks about the coming resurrection for all people. Listen, it doesn't matter what comes for us in this world. It doesn't matter what hardship. There is a hope of a resurrection that draws us forward and says we can do this. The first followers who only knew their Jewish scriptures proclaimed this. Their experience and their own narratives related and conveyed, written down over time, referenced these major touch points from the days of old. And their experience seemed to parallel that. In other words, their experience of the resurrected Lord fit with what they knew about the resurrection of the Lord that was promised and would come for all people. And the church that wrote down those, that creed so many, many hundreds of years ago refers continuously back to those words. And every Sunday, you and I stand before God and we play almost as if we are facing the world itself and all that comes for us and says, no, we will not be defeated by what this world brings. The people who experienced Jesus' death, who were at his burial, then experienced Jesus' resurrection and who had experienced this resurrected Lord, not as a ghost, by the way, not as a ghost, some paranormal experience, but we're told that their experience was deeply of a new kind of being, something they had no knowledge or wisdom of. I find in my own journey I tend to have a lot more faith in the first witnesses and the first narratives and hypotheses about what might really have happened that are not dependent upon their tales. I believe in the church reaffirms the reality that human beings had a very real, mysterious, unexplainable experience of the risen Lord. Furthermore, what they understood was that this was the end of death. that death had been defeated by Jesus. That Jesus' resurrection was not simply that he was the first to be resurrected, but that he had meant, had acted in such a way that death no longer could hold us in the grave. Hostages we would not be 
As in John Chrysostom's Easter sermon, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life, risen on the third day. Death has no hold over us. And if you've ever been to an Episcopal funeral, you'll hear that over and over again. Give us rest, O Christ, thy servants with thy saints, where sorrow and pain are no more drawing on Paul's book of the Romans, not just making up stuff there, but actually drawing on Scripture, characterized as as our burial in joy with the certainty that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers or height nor depth nor anything else in creation will separate us from the love of God. A statement of faith that is deeply rooted in our tradition. And this also means that in life, that in life, we who proclaim this are bearers of that same hope into the world. How many times have have we wondered what to say to somebody who's shared deeply with us, who's been afraid of their own mortality or what they face? and not really known what to say. Sometimes, certainly, listening is the best option. But inside each of us, we are prepared Sunday after Sunday to offer a bit of hope that no matter what they face, it will not have the last word, that God loves them, that God hopes for better than them, than their experience at this moment, that there is hope in their life. This will not be the last thing. There are greater things to remember of hope and love and family's love for you and friendship love for you and that church's love for you. How many times have we lacked for words, but every Sunday we prepare ourselves to have the words. We do not need to be afraid. We do not. We are yet this so concerned about all kinds of things. And Jesus is there with us, risen from the grave, sending his comforter, the Holy Spirit. When we say that we are Christian and when we say the Nicene Creed, we are standing as if before death itself and saying, no more. No more. No. (laughs) That's bold, people. (laughs) That is a bold thing to say. And when you don't believe it, because imagine you're just like me, there gotta be days where you don't believe it, right? Right, that's a human nature to not believe, to seek other solutions, other answers, right? I mean, that's normal. It's the human brokenness to think, oh, God won't provide for us, right? It's okay. It's actually okay, because that's the way it is. But then on Sunday, when we come back here, we get to hear it again. In case you doubted, right? In case you're sitting here today and you doubted this week whether or not God actually has hope for your life and loves you and has taken care of all those things that are in front of you. If you came here today wondering whether or not there was anything good that you could hold on to today, we will say, No, there is something more than what we experience in this world. And it provides us with hope and courage to stand against evil and death, to renounce it, to say, you have no power over me in this world anymore. I might have forgotten that this week. Have mercy on me. Might have forgotten. Might have lacked a little bit of faith. God doesn't say well. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that did it. <laughs> Sorry. You slipped in a big way. I just can't go forward. And we say those words, and then whether it's baptism or Eucharist, we actually participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. It runs through all of our service. We make and proclaim together that belief in the resurrection of Jesus invites us to a life that mirrors such love. 
such love, such hope, and we go out to try again. What I can promise you as your bishop is I believe this. I believe it. And if you ever doubt, you could even email me and I'll tell you I believe it. I won't give you my email address, but you could. (laughs) That's why you got David and Cole, all the others here. But it's true. I believe it. And the church believes it. The big church. The church believes this. And we are here Sunday after Sunday to remind you great things await you. Good things await you. God's grace awaits you. In part because death has been trampled down by our Lord Jesus on the third day when he rose again accordance, according to the scriptures. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.